Hello, today I want to share with you a serious topic that ironically is called smiling depression. This is something very insidious, very dangerous in a sense, because the person who suffers from smiling depression suffers a whole lot. I'm going to explain to you what it is and then share some news that um, I got out of uh, Women's Health magazine. This really interesting article in the April 2017 edition of Women's Health. And um, when you, if, if you're not a clinician, if you don't work with depression, and uh, somebody were to tell you about depression, the first image that comes to your mind, usually when you think of somebody depressed, is somebody who's in bed, who's not doing anything. And those are, you know, th those are features associated with depression and uh, in some cases, severe depression. But it's not exactly what we see with smiling depression. What you see with smiling depression is the opposite. You see a person who is energetic, a person who is, as the name implies, smiling. They present, they show up, they go to work, they're somewhat functional. You know, uh, some people object to the idea that they're, you know, functionally depressed because they say, well, they're not quite all that functional. But still, the point is that they show up with a smile on their face and they say all the positive things and so forth. But on the inside, they're suffering. And the central feature of that suffering is a profound sense of sadness. And we're going to go through some examples here in the article. What makes Smiling depression, particularly dangerous in some extreme cases, is that unlike a fully clinically depressed person who suffers from lack of energy, sometimes they don't, just don't have the motivation, the energy to do much, much less harm themselves. In the case of smiling depression, the person does have the energy and the enthusiasm to carry out their plans. I mean, they're smiling, they're working, they're doing things, right? So in some cases, the sadness can be so overwhelming that they will have the energy to carry out their self-destructive thoughts. And this is what makes smiling depression dangerous. That coupled with the fact that people in your general surroundings wouldn't even suspect that there is a problem there. So it's more difficult to ask for help. The great majority of these people are women and they are high-functioning women, women in positions of power, authority, you know, in other words, they're capable people. And for a capable person, sometimes it's very difficult to seek health, help, much less mental health type help. You know, it's very, very difficult in some cases because there's still the stigma that depression is a sign of weakness, a moral issue. I mean, all kinds of uh, medieval ideas that are simply not true. It is a medical, a mental health condition that needs to be addressed professionally and needs to be properly addressed because not only a person's well-being, not only a person's happiness is at stake here, but as I just indicated, in some cases, a person's life is in danger. So we need to, we need to be careful with this. In the article, this is a copy of the Women's Health article. In this article, they do something really interesting. They they list eight examples of eight different women that they picked somewhere. I guess they wrote in when they were doing the research for the article. And these women have captions, maybe in their social media pages or so forth. You know, in other words, they have phrases that describe what they present to the world. Uh, in other words, who am I, the way they present to the world. So here's a, here are some examples of that. You know, this woman says, um, Sometimes you just have to smile, especially when you're so cute. That's what one woman would say. Then this other woman would say, sometimes it's the little things that bring the most joy. And you would read these things about these people and uh, you would think, oh my gosh, how charming, right? But in these two examples that I just read, the first woman, uh, this is how she really felt. This is written by the woman herself. She says, so the caption again is what? She says, sometimes you just have to smile, especially when you are this cute, how she really felt is today's tough one. Feeling sad, overwhelmed, and emotionally drained at trying to escape from dealing with my father's death. Smiling depression. Another woman, sometimes it's the little things in life that bring the most joy. How I really felt. I wish I had half of the energy of this puppy. Earlier today I was driving and looking for objects to crash into. You know how many accidents that we see on the road are actually the product of people looking for an accident to escape some sort of emotional situation. Another one. On Wednesdays, we wear pink. 
so happy on Wednesdays wear pink and they all wear pink and all. How I really felt. My best friend took me to the store because I hadn't been out of the house in days. I don't really know what's going on or what day it is. So, another woman says, Happy Hamilton Day. How I really felt? I want to melt away. My husband and I had a big fight about my anxiety. So I put my sunglasses on and let the tears roll down. So these examples that show up in the uh, magazine are not meant evidently to criticize or anything like this. It's just a, a call to all of you out there. If you believe that you or anybody that you know is going through something like smiling depression, let's talk about this because number one, there is help. Number two, you deserve a better life. In other words, if you pay attention to these examples, you may identify with them. The same may be happening in your life. This suffering is just too much. Nobody should live like that. Now, let's talk about solutions to this. Here in the article, they list um, essentially five, it boils down to four different types of solutions that a person can use to help with smiling depression and really all forms of depression. Um, I don't actually have to read this because I know what they are. So let's just put this down. One of them, of course, is therapy. And in the article, they talk about two different forms of therapy. One is CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, and um, IPT, interpersonal therapy. They're both different. These are just technical terms from your point of view. It's really not that important. In therapy, the most important thing is how you connect to your therapy, whether you feel understood and you feel that you're making progress, whether we use um, one style or one modality or one technique or another, research shows is not the most important thing. The most important thing being, of course, the competence of the therapist, but the number one thing being whether you feel understood and whether the therapy is actually allowing you to make progress. In other words, there's a sense of progress. We're getting something done. The biggest criticism that people are experiencing therapy is, well, nothing happens. We just talk and talk and he listens and nothing happens. In my 21 years doing this job, I have never, ever, ever known of anybody <laughs> who gave us that kind of feedback. All kinds of other feedback. Never been told, well, we're just talking, nothing happens. All of our sessions are extraordinarily active. Um, to a certain extent, hard work. But um, thank God, for the most part, we get the job done. Now, I don't use CBT or IPT. We use something different. We use something called hypnotherapy. But I want to show you why and what the difference is. Because in the article, they talk about therapy, right? And they list two different modalities. And then they talk about three other things that, are, that have been found to be useful as well. One being yoga, of course. The other being um, exercise and the other being lifestyle modifications including diet diet being a big one so these are big deals and these are important things to talk about let's start with diet the last one that I mentioned diet plays a huge uh, role in, in feelings and emotions you know it's more than most people imagine I mean unless you pay attention to this you wouldn't realize it start with your level of energy now this is a whole separate topic. I don't want to be too long with this, and I don't want to diverge into too many different topics. But we, there's an epidemic in our country of um, obesity, diabetes, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome. And you may have heard of all these different terms, and they're all related somehow. But I'll be honest, the medical evidence and the medical knowledge on this is quite clear and incontrovertible. This is all, the, all of these terms that I just uh, told you about, they all have to do with overeating and particularly overeating starches and, and, and carbohydrates. And that type of um, food consumption begins, in, in other words, we begin to lose energy, we feel lethargic. In other words, it has a, an organic effect that leads down into depression through a very complicated pathway. And um, there's no question that when a person changes their diet, and this has been proven and has been studied and has been talked about, and we don't really need any studies. Anybody who's ever done this, change their diet, healthier, more vegetables, and they, they know that they feel better. We don't really need a scientific study to validate the obvious. Um, but here's the thing. Okay, let, before I tell you the thing, let's just go back to exercise. So then they do this big, expensive study and conclude that exercise helps with depression, you know? 
Well, I don't think there's any news there either. I appreciate the study and I appreciate the, the authors of the studies, but really? I mean, everybody already knows that too. You see, it isn't that people were just not exercising and eating uh, sugar all day because the studies hadn't told them to do otherwise. It isn't that. It's that we're addicted to the sedentary lifestyle and to the sugary diet. So before the studies came out, people already knew that perhaps we should eat differently and we should probably exercise more as humanity has been exercising naturally for millennia before we had this mechanized modern lifestyle. People had to work physically to survive. So um, what kept us from exercising more and eating so poorly wasn't the lack of studies. What kept us from doing that is that we became addicted to a type of diet and lifestyle. So we can talk about the benefits of yoga, we can talk about the benefits of exercise, we can talk about the benefits of changing our diet. And most people, they go to their doctors, they're told to quit smoking as an example, eat better, exercise more, and they do that for a day or two and then they quit. And so do I and so does everybody else because there's something in our subconscious mind that kind of predisposes us to a particular lifestyle which generates things like smiling depression. So the key here isn't simply to present the patient with a bunch of studies showing that a particular type of diet would improve your depressive symptoms. That's not enough. The thing is that the person already knows that. And I've been working in this field. We have a school here. We've been doing this for many, many, many years. Everybody already knows all of that. What people don't know is how to actually make the change. In other words, I remember one time, you know, I prepared a, a talk on obesity and weight loss. And I, you know, prepare and promoted the idea. And I walk into this room. And there are about 100 people there, you know. And, and I'm supposed to be the expert on weight loss. And... You know, I'm a little heavier now, but at the time I was even I was even fitter, I guess. And uh, um, you know, I walk into this room and I and I realize there are 100 overweight people, and I had prepared all this technical presentation. This was many years ago, and I was less experienced, I guess. And I was going to tell them about calories and how the different, you know, how when you consume fat versus proteins, what that does to blood sugar, how insulin is a storage hormone, and all of this technical. Uh, stuff and how you know and but, but I was taken aback you know I, I just got up, up there to the podium and I'm looking at these human beings who obviously were suffering with this condition and who are used to being told that it's their fault somehow and there's a point to the story and I just kind of looked at them in the eyes you know for what seemed like a long time I don't know actually how long it was I'm just there like looking at these people and, and my heart was filled with compassion. I know they were suffering. And I knew something else as I looked at them. I knew that they're all experts on calories and nutrition and what foods to eat and what foods not to eat. I knew right then and there that the problem wasn't lack of knowledge about food. I knew that. I just knew it. I don't know. I just knew it. And the entire talk that I had prepared, I kind of threw away. I don't usually, I don't use notes when I, when I do my classes or my talks. Uh, but the concept that I was going to discuss, I, I disregarded because it wasn't, wasn't about that. That was not the need. And I think that that's what's really important in our profession, to satisfy the need. What is the actual need? The need wasn't more information about calories and nutrition and vitamins and, or, or whether or not they should exercise and what kind of exercise. That was not the need because... They knew that already. Something else is happening there. In other words, it's almost as if we feel trapped into something that we cannot change. Because there's a cycle. There's a vicious cycle there. We eat a certain way. We feel a certain way. I remember in high school, in junior, my junior year, my, I think it was my senior year, whatever, my, in high school, I remember I took this health class. And the teacher was wonderful, Mr. Mohausen. I'll never forget him. You know, it's been a few years already, but I'll never forget that class. And the teacher was wonderful, and he lived on a farm. This was up in Minnesota. And um, he drove like 50-some miles every day to school, and then, you know, he woke up like at 3 in the morning to run the farm and then went to work at 7 in the morning, you know, teach a class all day, and then went back to work on the farm. The guy was fascinating, you know. But anyway, he um, in his classroom, he had all these posters with different phrases that were presumably things we should remember. And one of the things that was written there is, you are what you eat. I was in high school back then. I wasn't a hypnotist back then. I was in high school. And um, 
I knew right then and then, and I even asked him, and we had this huge discussion because we had a whole class on nutrition, it was a health class, and he kept emphasizing that you are what you eat. And he went from the, you know, he came from the perspective that, and I remember, I remember the class like was last night, you know, he was talking about how a typical orange has 60 milligrams of vitamin C. And I remember details of this class, you know, and he's going through nutrition and how we need this vitamin and that vitamin and so forth, you know. And he kept saying, if we don't get the vitamins, remember, you are what you eat, you know, and this will happen, that will happen, you are what you eat. And I told him, Mr. Mohausen, what if it's the other way around? What if we eat what we are? And it took a couple of tries because I guess he attributed the nonsensicality of my phrase to my accent. And maybe uh, this guy's a foreigner. He doesn't know what I'm talking about. He doesn't understand English, you know, that type of thing. This was a few years back. And I told him, no, 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 no. What I'm saying to you is, what if it is the other way around? What if we eat what we are? Not we are what we eat, but the other way around. And after I was able to get my point across to him, he actually scratched his head and said, well, that's interesting. Well, class was over and we never talked about that again. But I've been practicing hypnotherapy for many years. And I can tell you, it is true that we are what we eat in the sense that the body is built from the organic compounds that we consume and so forth. You know, But I can tell you that we end up eating what we are in the sense that you know, if we're depressed, we eat more sugar. If we are happy and healthy and glowing we tend to eat a healthier diet in other words we are you know we eat what we are it goes both ways but emotions and mental states absolutely affect diet and what we eat so once again when you tell a person who has smiling depression that if they could only change their diet and exercise more for instance they could eliminate the depression with all due respect to the authors of the article, which I think is excellent, I really enjoyed reading the article, it is, but, but in my clinical experience, it's almost an offense. It's like telling a person who's hurting and they're screaming, you know, let's say they, they bang their finger with the hammer and they're screaming in pain, you know, and you say, well, if only you wouldn't have hit your finger with the hammer, you wouldn't be screaming right now. It's like, at the, that's true, but at that moment, it's like, you know, it's a little weird. Imagine you hit your finger and you're screaming and then the guy says, well, if only the hammer wasn't made out of metal and uh, if you hadn't impacted your finger with the hammer, perhaps you wouldn't be screaming right now. Technically, it's a true statement. If I hadn't, uh, you know, I wouldn't be hurting and I wouldn't be screaming. But I think it's a little insensitive and not only is it insensitive, it actually does not lead to a solution. So to tell a depressed person who eats what he is, in other words, to tell a depressed person who is eating poorly because he's depressed that if only he changed his diet, he perhaps wouldn't be so depressed, does feel almost like an insult because if he could change his diet, he probably wouldn't be depressed today. And that goes on and on and on for all of these different uh, types of advice. Oh, the other, um, the other suggestion that the article has, I almost forgot the most important one, of course, is medications. The article itself says that, you know, you can take many, many weeks for it to work. Everybody knows this. Antidepressant medication, SSRIs. These are technical terms that you may or may not be familiar, but don't worry, it's not important. The point is that the kinds of medications that people use for depression are notoriously, take, they take, long, take a long time to, 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 to have an effect on you. In other words, you start taking medication today, it might be weeks before you begin to feel the effects, and you might have some side effects. And then we may have to adjust the medication up or down or a different brand or a different class of medication. And by the time we get it right, many months may have gone by. And then you're still dealing with a chemical way of masking how you feel. And nothing wrong with that. I'm the first one to suggest medications when we need it. But the problem with that strategy is that we're not dealing with the causes. And if we rely on the medication long term, there's something called adaptation at a cellular level and um, the dosages will eventually have to be increased to create the same effect. Dosages of medications can only be increased so much before the medication becomes toxic, and then we have to switch classes of medication. And essentially, the bottom line is that over the years, people tend to, um, to, do, to, to not do well. In other words, we keep on changing medications, things begin to get worse for them. The idea is to use medication only temporarily, but simultaneously look for causes and heal so that we can get off the medications. Don't feel bad if you're taking medication. Feel great because you're doing the right thing. You're taking care of yourself. But at the same time, and this is not true for all kinds of medications, by the way, and not all patients and not all people, 
because some people do need the medication for life, different conditions, different situations. But in some cases, I'm talking about smiling depression. In some cases, the reliance on long-term use of medication can actually be detrimental. Things will get worse in some cases. So these are things that, of course, you're going to discuss with your doctor, with your therapist, you know, and uh, formulate a strategy. But we can talk about all kinds of technicalities and technicalities and strategies if we don't address you. It's not going to get much better. I can tell you that for a fact. Listen, I've been doing this for many years. And um, I remember when I was younger, you know, I always thought that if I take one more course, if I get one more specialty, if I get one more certification in a particular technique, you know, I can help more clients. That's how I justified it to myself. And over the years, I've learned that most people are just miserably alone. And what they actually need is to tell their stories. They need to be able to speak. They need to be able to express themselves in a non-judgmental setting where they are understood. It isn't enough for me to go outside and tell my story to the wind. I need to tell my story to somebody who understands me. And understanding someone else and actually feeling compassion for what they're going through is something that in some cases take years to develop. Um, it isn't quite so trivial as it sounds. Some people um, devote a lifetime to developing those skills. But listen, understanding, feeling the compassion, and have something to offer that actually makes a difference is a, is a tremendously valuable asset to our society. There are many people who are capable of doing those things around and uh, find one of them because it will change your life. The other thing is when it comes time to change, well, we're going to have to, in other words, I identified some of these issues that I have, now how do I change them? Let's say, for instance, addictions. And I don't just mean addictions like, you know, drugs or things like this. I mean even things like food and diet. Addiction to a diet that I realize is detrimental to my well-being. Well, how do we change that? I, I'm actually feeling uh, happy about that because many months ago, I gave up on one of my one of my addictions was coffee. I drank a huge amount of coffee, <laughs> and uh, I thought I could never get off of that. It's just an addiction. Like we kind of justify, we deny, we read articles that says caffeine is good for you, whatever. No, it's an addiction, and I'm not judging anybody who drinks coffee. I was one of those who drank a huge amount of it, and the Cuban coffee, if you're familiar with it, the espresso, very strong coffee, you know, four or five a day, a lot of it, you know, and. Um, and, and for years, that was the case, until one day, for several reasons, you know, I started looking at it as an addiction, as for, for what it is, and I um, decided to address it. And thank God, you know, it took some effort because the habit, the desire, the, you know, and there's a social component. You go somewhere to have the coffee. You know, there's a whole bunch of things that go into it. It's escape from the office because I go to the cafeteria next door. You know, there are people there. You say hello to the people. So... An addiction, not just to the substance, but to the whole act of consuming the substance, you know, and overcoming that. It's been several months already, beginning of this year, 2017. So we're, what, in July now. It's been a while, and um, it's holding perfectly well. You know, the energy is back, sleep is improved, you know. So I can talk about addictions, and, and, and by the way, taking care of that allowed me to look at some other things as well. I... Um, and I don't want to bore you with my personal details, but I can tell you that uh, I was able to overcome some other addictions as well. And this might be simple and ridiculous things to some of you, but I'll give you another example. How about biting your nails? You know, not a big deal. It wasn't like I was chewing my fingers down to the roots of the, the, the bones. It wasn't like that kind of thing. But um, you would look at me and my nails were never properly, they were, they were never, they were always chewed up, you know, ugly. And uh, plus, you know, your finger in your mouth, whatever, you know. And that had been the case for many, many years. Once I took care of the coffee, about a month later, I realized, dude, this is powerful. I can actually do this. You know, you begin to feel more empowered. As you take care of one thing, you feel empowered to take care of other things. It's been several months already, and it's holding, and it feels good. Um, it's a small thing, but it's also a big thing, because what's behind it is a big thing. Having the will, having the energy to take care of some of these things will improve the quality of your lives. And you might ask, well, how did you accomplish that? Well, the difference between 
In other words, how can I put this? The way we do these things is by using the exact same thing that I practice with the people who come over to the office. We use hypnosis. We use visualization. We use the same exact things that we do all day with all of you wonderful people who come over and, uh, and interact with us here at the office. So you can accomplish the same and more. It all depends on what your goals are, what your objectives are. But certainly, certainly, if you identify with the notion of smiling depression, let's take care of this. Let's talk about this because you deserve a better life. We're going to continue talking about some of these other topics, and I think we're going to have a good time. Stay tuned in the channel because I'm going to be uploading other videos um, with, with topics of, uh, of a great deal of importance. And I think it's important to disseminate this type of information so that people can improve the quality of their lives. We're living in a new century now. We're in the century of quality of life. You know, back in the 20th century, coming from the 19th century, quality of life was perceived as improving the number of gadgets that we have, having better gadgets, more gadgets, you know, electrical devices in the house, you know, and that's quality of life. Having a car that can actually, you know, in other words, um, things was, uh, so, you know, having things, better things was perceived as uh, an opportunity to improve the quality of your life. But in the 21st century, if you look around, um, people talk about connectivity, people talk about relationships, globalization. In other words, quality of life nowadays is associated with something very different. It's associated with freedom, but freedom internally, freedom from ourselves. You deserve that sort of freedom. You deserve that sort of quality of life. So stay tuned in this channel. Remember to like the, the video so that you can be um, made aware of the new ones that are posted. And this way we can continue this dialogue and your life, you know, you deserve a great life as well. Be well.